thanks for joining the October webinar on ORCID EFT processing. Today, the topic is uh, tips and tricks for consultants, and Anne and I will go through a series of things. So uh, we'll be hopping between PowerPoint and Sage 300 a couple of times during the presentation. So the focus is on um, both implementing new sites with EFT, some upgrade tips, as well as helping you troubleshoot support questions. We'll start with some upgrade tips since EFT 2021 has just been released and talking about uh, 2021 before we uh, delve into uh, EFT. Just want to give you a brief update on where we are with 2021 release. We have our release uh, EFT, RMA, been tracking and process scheduler with uh, the other three, extender, information manager and uh, inter-entity uh, due in the next couple of days. And I just wanted to make a brief announcement regarding um, Extender, the next uh, product update, called Product Update 8, which applies to version 2018 all the way to 2020, uh, enforces the uh, workflow users in a slightly different way. So if you are using Extender workflow, please get in touch with us to um, get an updated activation code. So back to our EFT processing agenda, we will uh, share some tips around EFT formats. Focus a little bit on uh, all the elements of EFT that help you um, implement this in the most secure manner. Have some uh, tips around creating the EFT file, how to reprocess transactions and how to use clearing banks in uh, AP. Emailing is an important part of using EFT and an important part of the support questions we get on EFT. So we will look at a couple of tips around that. And then we will go through uh, an overview of what some of the functionality you can have with EFT and AR around creating AR receipts, AR refund batches and updating invoice due date. This is not a detailed training on these functionality. There, is, there are some other um, videos on that. And then we will have a few EFT payroll tips. Um, and again, we're covering payroll as we go in upgrades, format, security, um, et cetera. But there's a few EFT payroll specific tips that we will uh, cover as well. So first um, upgrade. So yes, EFT version 2021 has been released. And some of the questions that um, that we get is, um, do we need new activation codes? Yes, you do. New activation codes will be sent um, in bulk for all your users who are current as of the 31st, the 30th of September. But in the meantime, if you need an upgrade, you can ask us for uh, the codes. You will need to download and install the uh, version 2021. You have to run EFT 2021 with Sage 2021, EFT 2020 with Sage 2020, uh, and that actually applies to all of ORCID modules. Once you have installed, and that particularly applies if you are um, doing an upgrade on the same server rather than using a new server, you have to activate version 2021. In most cases, you will get prompted, but sometimes if you still have a working of another version, um, you, may, um, you may miss that step. So this is a, a common um, support question. So we suggest that once you've done your upgrade, you go into the EFT options updates tab and make sure that you are running the version you think you are running. If you are using user formats, custom formats that you have developed yourselves or that we might have sent you for some specific requirements, you need to copy them into the appropriate folder for the version you're running. In the case of version 2021, it is EL68A. And again, if you have uh, amended your remittance advice layouts, the update, the crystal forms need to be copied into the EL68A folder. And if you are using customization directories, then um, that process is um, a little bit simpler. So we won't show you how to uh, install and activate, but we will point to you where the files actually are. 
EFT formats, most of you probably uh, have been working with um, Stacy on some custom formats. So this is a um, little picture of Stacy on the bottom left here. And you know she is our expert at EFT formats. We create new formats regularly when it's requested because it's a, um, a new bank that you're working with. We don't have a format for it yet. Uh, we do that for you for all the supported versions of, uh, of Sage 300. If you are doing your own customizations, we um, strongly recommend you do not update the formats.ini as it, your changes could be overwritten in a product update or product upgrade. So you would use the user formats and or customization directories. Some of the examples of scenario where you might require a custom format, not necessarily because it is a new bank, is um, sometimes the bank format exists, but your bank requires a different originator ID for AP, AR, and payroll. And some of our formats support it and others don't. So when you ask us, we would then send you a new format. You may, uh, your bank may require a pre-note format to, uh, to do some testing. And again, while some of our formats support it, for others, we would need to do um, an update to the formats.ini. And similarly with the positive pay files. So we'll have a look at using customization directories to make um, maintenance of the, of the formats uh, and upgrades easier, in particularly if you are installing Sage 300 on all workstations. In such cases, if we send you an updated formats.ini or a user formats.ini, if you have Sage 300 installed on all workstations, not just a workstation setup, then you would need to copy the updated formats in, on all the machines unless you're using a customization directory. So on that, I will hand over to Anne to do the demonstration of this first phase. Thanks, Natalie. Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, as Natalie mentioned, uh, we do formats for people, for any customer free of charge, uh, either new or amended ones, depending what they need. And when we send you a new formats.ini, you stick it into your Sage programs directory. And if you are running Sage on each and every workstation, a full workstation setup, then you need to stick this formats.ini on each and every C drive or wherever you've installed the Sage programs to, unless you're using customization directories. So that is the one case where we would say put the formats.ini in the customization directory because then it's applicable to all workstations. But uh, barring that particular um, installation setup, you would have one formats.ini in the uh, programs directory. And you may have noticed when you first go into options or go into create EFT file, it says loading file types. And that can also happen after you do a product update. So if we've made any changes, new formats, amended formats, since you last installed or you know, for you, when you first activate, the, what um, the EFT options screen and the create EFT file does is looks for the formats.ini. If it's got a more recent date and time than what's currently loaded, it will load that. So you are now working off the latest uh, formats.ini when you go ahead and create an EFT file. So that is why you sometimes get that, um, you know, that happening. So it loads the formats.ini, but it also loads the user formats.ini if it exists in that programs directory, or as we recommend, if you create, a so in admin services, you go ahead and create yourself a customization directory. I've created one for all my companies, um, but that can be however, at, at whatever detail level you need. And then within your customization directory, you have an EL, in this case, 2021 68A directory, and it's got my user formats.ini in. So the precedence for formats.ini, user formats.ini, customization directory, process, programs directory, etc., is first it will look for a user formats.ini in your customization directory. Um, if it doesn't find one there, it will look in your programs directory for a user formats.ini. Um, so user formats.ini takes precedence. 
Um, if it doesn't find a user formats.any in either of those two places, it will then look for a formats.any in the customization directory. And if it doesn't find it there, it will look for a formats.any in the programs directory. So uh, that is uh, how um, you know how it finds which format it's going to use and why it's so important to use customization directories, especially if you've got uh, individual uh, cust uh, installations per workstation, uh, as opposed to a workstation setup, you install the Sage programs on each and every machine. And when you're doing an upgrade, if you're using customization directories and if you have put the, your custom uh, reports uh, that you're using, uh, sorry, that's uh, my information manager, here's EFT. If you've put your customized uh, remittance advices in your customization directory, when you upgrade to 68A, it's very easy just to copy the contents of that to this folder and all your customizations are sitting there. Uh, you don't, you know, it makes the upgrade uh, much uh, easier and more documented when you come to do it. And again, we recommend if you are creating your own user formats um, or changing the formats, don't work in the formats.any file. We will replace that with every version and product upgrade that product update that you do. So you copy the format that you want out of formats.any and you put it in user formats.any, either in the customization directory or the programs directory, and you do the changes there. Back to you, Natalie. Thank you. Need to make myself the presenter again. The next uh, topic we're going to look at in a bit of detail is EFT security and some configuration options that help you make that site as secure as possible. The first thing we'll look at is how you can have a separation of duties and a two-level approval for any um, new or to amend bank account details and that applies to EFT vendors, customers and employees. So you configure your um, EFT to default to a status of entered and then other users with different security groups in Sage 300 can make it active and it's only when the record is active in EFT that it can be included in an EFT file. We'll also um, remind you that all changes to uh, bank account details are logged in the EFT audit log. We'll look at the options to encrypt your bank uh, branch account details, financial institution um, level. And again, that applies to vendors, customers and employee details, as well as your bank account in, um, in EFT banks. The next level of security is around the actual uh, EFT file itself. If you are saving it on a network folder, this is around Windows uh, security, so your user profile security on the file where you're saving, on the folder where you're saving the file. But you can also use SFTP. Either it is provided by the bank where EFT can upload directly to the bank SFTP site using a password or a key file. But in some cases, if you want some additional security, even if your bank doesn't provide it, you can set up your own SFTP and make sure that EFT uploads to it and only a few limited users who actually need to um, read from that file to upload to the bank know the detail to connect to that SFTP site. And finally, we look at how you can password protect the uh, attachment to the email remittance advice for um, EFT uh, vendors, so payments, uh, refund receipts, and employee uh, pay slips. So back to you, Anne. Thank you, Natalie. In EFT processing on the options for both AP or all AP, AR, and payroll, you can specify what the default vendor status is. It can be entered, active, or inactive. Um, sorry, I should have introduced the topic. I'm talking about two, you know, having two levels of uh, approval on the EFT vendor, the EFT customer, or the employee's 
uh, EFT details before that uh, those details can be used in a EFT file. So if you set the default status to entered, what that means is when you create or import your AP vendor or your AR customers act details into um, into the uh, EFT vendor record or EFT customer record or into the payroll uh, customer record, if that was set to entered as well. When, when the record is first created or when the record is amended, so whenever uh, and as a user comes and amends this record, the status would flick back to entered. And if I tried to create an EFT file to pay vendor 1200, it would say that the vendor's bank account details is not activated. So you would have your users in two different groups. The one user who is able to, uh, using the security groups in admin services for EFT processing, you would have a group uh, where the Anne can only enter. So Anne is allowed to edit the vendor's EFT details and presumably customer and payroll, depending how that goes. And then Natalie perhaps is able to approve so Natalie wouldn't be able to go and create a new record, but when she goes to the uh, EFT vendor's record, she is the one who's able to flick it from entered to active and save that. And then, so therefore any details which are newly imp uh, edited or amended need to be approved by a second person before those details can be included in the file. And while I'm here, um, Whenever you automatically, you don't have to do any settings for this, whenever any changes happen to the EFT vendor, customer or employees record, it is automatically logged. And in the EFT audit log, you can filter to see all, I'm currently filtering just to see my vendor 500, uh, 1350, so I'll just clear that filter. Um, control F and clear the filter. So in this log file, it's logging all changes that are happening to vendors, employees and customers. It logs the vendor ID or the customer ID, the field that changed, who did it, what it went from and what it went to. So if I just filter on vendors at this stage, you can see that vendor 1200, the file type used to be um, can RBC, oh, using the file type can RBC, the account name was changed by Susan from nothing to chloride systems. What you'll also see here in this log is I don't see the account number or the, um, the bank account number or the bank branch number. So it's called different things depending on the form types. So in, in Canada, it's called financial institution ID for the branch number um, and the account number is called account number. So I don't see, the even though I'm signed in as administrator, I don't see the full account number or branch number. It has been masked. So I only see the last four digits. And this is another setting in EFT options, which you are able to say encrypt the employee's uh, BSB account number. So that's for payroll, um, for AR you can encrypt, and for AP you can encrypt. So what that means is we store the full um, account number in an encrypted field, which is you know gobbledygook, you can't read. And in the visible fields, all you see is the um, a mask, a number of asterisks, and the last four digits of the file. You can also encrypt your own BSB number, so that's on the EFT Banks file. And then if you are using that encryption in all reports or all inquiries, as you saw, you, the field is masked, and only those people who have the ability to edit or approve the unencrypted details actually see the full account number and branch number on the EFT vendor customer employee. All other employees would just see the asterisks and the last four digits. Um, so. The next thing I'm going to show you is, uh, or talk about, is security on the EFT file. So this is the actual EFT file that gets created. So as you know, on your EFT banks, you would specify the bank number, uh, you know, per bank for AP, AR, and payroll. Where which directory do you want to save these files in? 
And these files get created according to the bank specification, including the fields that the bank um, has asked for. And in my EFT files directory, I've got this AP payments uh, folder and here are all the files that I've created um, so far on, uh, on this um, on the site. So you may choose to have that company specific or just AP payments in general, depending, uh, you know, depending how you want to save those. But the file sitting here is unencrypted. It is a text file based on the format that the bank asks for. People often ask us, why don't we encrypt that file? So we, we can't because, you know, if we encrypt the file and send it to the bank, then, the, you know, what's the bank going to do? Unless the bank provide an encryption routine, uh, we can't encrypt it because they need a way of unencrypting it. So there are a few banks that do provide an encryption routine, and in which case we can use Extender to encrypt that file and uh, send it, but most banks do not support that. Um, they do. So you need to use network security to protect this file, this directory. So normally what you'd have is the AP clerk who cre clicks create EFT file, they would need read write access to this directory. And then the person who's, go who's normally a separate person who's gonna upload it to the bank, they need a, a read directory to this uh, folder and limit the number of people who can access this folder uh, based on that. But what you can also do in um, EFT processing, and some banks allow you to do this directly, particularly in North America, is use um, SFTP with a password or SFTP with a key file. And what that is, then you fill in here the URL that the bank gives you, um, the user ID that they give you, and in this case, you they would send you a private key file, which you would detach from your email and pop in a defaulter directly, and here you would link to that file. So uh, the banks often call this encrypting with a with a private key file. It's not actually encrypted, but the two files need to be sent concurrently, and the uh, key file it's impossible to amend that. And if the key file doesn't match uh, the user ID and doesn't match the uh, another uh, coded field in the actual output file, then they will reject the file. So it's another security level and uh, many people are using that. So, so that's if your bank um, provides an FTP site. Um, I know RBC provides that, uh, JP Morgan provides that um, for certain account types. So uh, a lot of people are using that. But if, you, if your customer is concerned with security, what they can do is create their own FTP site. Um, so, you know, there's lots of shareware and open source FTP sites that you can use, plus uh, paid ones as well, which come with a bit more security. Um, but what that means is uh, the AP clerk who clicks create EFT file does not have access to the FTP site and doesn't know these details. Uh, only EFT does, and it will upload that file to your FTP site. And then the person who's going to upload that file to the bank is the only person who needs access to that FTP site. So it's a very much more secure. And as I showed you before, the EFT directory, this is where all the files are. If that's sitting on a secure FTP site, it's more protected. But you should also, both on the FTP site and as a normal routine, um, if it's on your network folder, is once you've finished with that file, is deleted. Um, EFT can't do that because we don't know when you've loaded it up and if you need to reload it or if there's, um, you know, if there's some reason why you're keeping it. So there should be some internal procedure that weekly or monthly, depending on how often they do their payments, they should clear down these files as well. Um, so the final protection that we have is in sending remittance advices, which is particularly um, relevant for payroll, but AP and AR as well. So on your AP, AR and payroll tabs, you can say, yes, we do want to apply a remittance advice uh, to, uh, sorry, a password to the remittance advice. And you are able to specify a formula using fields, in this case, from the employee record, but it could be the customer record or the vendor record. And in this case, it's going to take the rightmost three characters of the employee ID and join it to the rightmost three characters of the social security number 
from um, Canadian Peril or US Peril and uh, apply that as a password to the PDF that goes out. So for Peril, it applies it to the remittance advices if you're using that, but if you're using Peril to send your T4s and Releve 1s, it will apply it to that as well. And for AP and AR, it will apply it to the remittance advice. So when the vendor, customer or employee um, you know, double clicks on the PDF, the attached PDF, it will prompt them for this particular password. And when you're on the, uh, the associated record, for example, EFT employees, if you have the ability to see the password, you can see the automatically generated password. But in this case, I've also provided a password. So this particular employee is going to use this password where other employees might be using the automatically generated password. So the individual one, if defined on the employee, vendor or customer, will override the auto-generated one. But if you've got security rights, when you're maintaining these records, you can see what the password is. And I didn't mention, you can also specify a master password if you had done that, as I have done on my AP side. This password would open any of the remittance advices. Um, so if you do want to have a master password, you can. When you're attaching passwords um, to your PDFs, you must fill in the associated SMTP details because we are not able to password protect remittance advices being sent using Sage's um, EFT, uh, sorry, e EFT server. And that's because Sage you know, creates the PDF and emails all in one click using the uh, report object, Sage's report object. But if you fill in um, SMTP details here, we are in control of the report object. So we are able to uh, attach the password protected version to the report object before emailing it. So that applies to AP and AR. With EFT, if you are using Sage's um, um, SMTP to send it out um, and you are emailing out your payslips, uh, we will still apply a password I, I, sorry, if you're emailing out your pay slips and saving them in this directory, we will, even if you're using Sage's uh, email method to send out that um, password, uh, it won't be password protected as it goes out, but it will be password protected in this directory. So that's the only case where we will do an additional copy of the PDF for the pay slip and password protect it if you're saving it and if you've elected to password protect uh, the payroll documents going out. And I think that's the security that I was going to cover off. Thank you, Anne. That was uh, very um, exhaustive. So uh, thank you for covering so many tips. Let me... Um... Go back to um, the next topic is around creating a EFT file. Some tips around that. And again, one of the support common questions that we have is um, can't, can't create the file. There's variations of the error message that you get when you're trying to create the file. But in many cases, it is um, network security related. But in most cases, it is related to uh, having set the path to um, a mapped drive. So, you know, P for um, for payment, but the user who's um, trying to create the file does not have a mapped drive to P. So this is why we generally would recommend that you use UNC path, share a drive and enter in the EFT um, in the bank setup, backslash, 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 sorry, I can't say that word, and then um, your share name. We'll also touch on um, a security group that is probably not used very often, but can be relevant, is um, to ensure that few users have rights to changing the remittance advice layout. So you set up your default remittance advice, and then when the users go to print the remittance advice, it uses the default, they can't change it. And that is to ensure that they don't accidentally pick up uh, the wrong documents that may have irrelevant information or too much information about, uh, about the vendors, about the payment. 
You also have an option uh, to uh, to save your regular settings in the Create EFT file screen, which could be useful for users who um, have their own uh, file type that they use, or for example, if they do mainly international payments with the different file types or want to store their reference or description. We'll look at the options to reprocess a payment if you have, uh, if a payment has been rejected because the, the vendor details were, were, were wrong, for example, and that applies to, to customer and um, employees as well. So you can reverse the payment in bank services and re-enter a new payment batch and reprocess it in EFT. And you have a full audit everywhere in that, so that is the most correct way of doing it. But in some cases, people find that a little bit troublesome. So you have the option to allow selective payments for AP batch or AR batch or EFT um, payroll in the EFT option screen. And once that is allowed, when you create the file, you can select which particular payment you want to, um, to process. And finally, we will look at uh, when to use a clearing bank in your um, EFT um, configuration. And that is uh, only, it only applies to um, using AP EFT for AP payments. And it lets you have one uh, single line for your payment in your bank rec. So it makes your bank reconciliation easier in the cases where your bank will have one entry for the total amount of the payment. So let's now look at that in more detail. Over to you, Anne. Thanks, Natalie. So first, if we're talking about the how you define the folder for where you want to create the EFT files. So this is when you're using a network folder. So normally, you would be defining this as a folder on the server. And if you're using a map drive like E or Z or something like that, um, you know, all users must have the same mapping to the same location and this directory must exist. So EFT does not create directories on the fly. So that's one of the controls um, that the directory must be created and the security must be created uh, by, the, by the network administrator up, up front. But if you are going to be using a network drive uh, on the server, just to get around the problems with different mappings and um, network profiles, you should just use, you know, backslash, backslash, server name, and then the, the folder names. It just makes it um, consistent without having to do anything. It makes it consistent across uh, all machines. And we often get uh, support queries where either where this is not filled in correctly or at all, um, or the people just don't have access to it under their own individual network um, you know, logins because it's the network login that's controlling uh, what what access they have to paths. Um, we have had instances where the incorrect remittance advice has been sent um, or the incorrect report has been used with the remittance advice. So in those cases, what we recommend you do is in EFT options, specify what are the default or the only um, remittance advices formats you're going to use for your payments, receipts, refunds, and for your payroll remittance ad advice. And then in your security groups, you would only give um, some users the ability uh, to be able to select the uh, remittance advice layout. So only some users can change that at runtime. So when I come to print my remittance advice, whether it's going to be my payroll remittance advice or my um, AP and AR remittance advice, whether or not I can, this is editable and I can change this report depends on my EFT uh, security through admin services and it will default to what we've set up in EFT options. So I'm logged in as administrator and I can change this, but if I was a user without that ability, this would be displayed here, but grayed out, and I couldn't accidentally make a, uh, you know, have a different, uh, choose the wrong report and send the wrong information uh, to the wrong people. Um, the next thing we're going to look at is reversing a payment. 
So this is the case where you've already been to create an EFT file, uh, you've created for batch number one, and you've uploaded that to the bank, and the bank says to you the vendor bank account details on payment uh, number one was uh, incorrect. So the proper thing to do is to go and go to bank services, reverse the payment, change the vendor's bank account details, create a new batch, redo the payment, and then upload that file. So next time it would be batch number two or whatever the next batch number is that you use. Um, but some people find that uh, too laborious and they don't want to go through all those steps. It is the correct way to do it because you've got the full audit trail uh, through your banks uh, as to you know and EFT as to what files were created and what um, banks were you know what payments were um, sent through. But in the case where somebody doesn't want to do that, what you can do in EFT options for AP and AR and payroll, you can say allow selective payments from the AP payment batch, AR payment batch, or from the payroll run. And if you do allow that, although we don't recommend that you leave it on all the time, if you do allow that in create EFT file, you can then come back, you know, change your vendor's bank account details, come back and say, I don't want to do all entries in the batch. I just do entries that I select. And here you can say, you know, select all, turn on or off who you want to pay. And if I did that, when I create the EFT file, it's going to be only, it's only going to create, contain a record for vendor 1450. Um, and in the EFT log, uh, which I'll show you now, which gets created automatically every time you run create EFT file, it would show entry number one was skipped and uh, entry number two was made. So whenever you create an EFT file, we have a log of the file that was created. So this is the EFT creation number. Um, and then when you double click on it, it shows you which payments were made and it's you, it stores the bank account details and all the extra fields that you can set up in vendors, customers and payroll um, in, in this uh, log um, and whether it's included or excluded. So if I did it again and only included number two, this would say skipped. Um, so if you are going to use that, we would recommend that you, you know, turn it off again once you've done it, because it's it's probably better to know that it's entire files that are done in this as opposed to just individual entries. It's a better control. You know, your batch total equals your uh, EFT file total or your log total, which you see here, which equals the total that you upload um, through to the bank. Um, clearing accounts. Uh, so clearing accounts uh, are used only when you're, you, you know that AP, when you post an AP payment batch, it posts to the bank rec uh, for that bank in detail. So if you had 10 payments, you get 10 individual lines on your bank rec. And if that's how your bank statement comes back to you, then that's fine. You wouldn't use EFT clearing bank accounts. But here in Australia, I know for sure, and I'm not, uh, don't know too much about all the banks in in North America, but in Australia, more often than not, your bank statement will come back with just a single withdrawal for your EFT batch, and that's why we have EFT clearing accounts. So on your banks, when you set up your EFT bank, you can set it up either as a regular. Um, a regular bank bank type. So that means that when you do, this is your real bank account uh, in, in bank services, this is your bank, um, and you do your AP payment batch against that batch. And when you create EFT file, nothing extra happens apart from formatting the file into this directory that you've requested. But if you do have the case where your bank a statement is consolidated into a single withdrawal, then you would use EFT clearing um, bank accounts. So I've created in common services, I've created myself a bank called EFT clear. It's just got a 999, you know, suspense type GL clearing account. Um, and I say it's a clearing bank account for my bank CCB. So when I come to do my AP payment or my um, my AP payment, it only affects AP because uh, you can control your deposits uh, from AR 
whether they go through consolidated or individual. So you can control that from an AR side, but you can't control it from an AP side. So when we post the AP payment batch, we must do it against the EFT clear account. And then at the minute it's posted, what EFT does is a bank transfer between EFT clear and CCB. So if I go to my bank services and um, look at my bank rec for EFT clear, So for, for my EFT clear, if I look at what's uh, waiting for reconciliation, you can see I did a payment batch for against um, EFT clear for three entries, which totaled 700. And when that was posted, it was transferred through to, um, to CCB. And on CCB, I would have that single uh, withdrawal coming out of CCB. And, uh, you know, as a ongoing thing, you should reconcile these uh, as you go. Uh, so you'll always have the latest EFT payment that you've made and you can just reconcile that, um, you know, when the bank confirms that that's gone through and on your bank statement, you've got the correct um, balance sitting there. Um, so that's over to you, Natalie. Just before we move on to the next topic, there's a question on this. Any plans of making the clearing bank available for payroll with automatic creation of the bank transfer? No, we um, haven't We haven't gone there because uh, it's complicated the way payroll posts through to banks. So um, no, we, I, I don't think we're going to do that. It's not as simple as posting an AP payment batch. Sorry, sorry, Prabha. Thank you. Okay, so if we looked at uh, creating sorry, EFT Sorry, content. Natalie, can I just interrupt? It's, um, Andrew's sure. got a, a relevant uh, uh, comment here with, to say at this stage. Um, when, uh, when reversing the payment with a clearing bank, manual steps are required. Yes, you're quite correct, Andrew, that is correct. So if you, if you did, if one of the payments was um, to be redone, and you don't just go through, um, you know, you don't want to just go through entries that I select and, and remake it. If you are going to reverse the payments, um, or indeed if the payment for some reason didn't go through, you need to reverse it from your EFT clearing account. Uh, go, go, do Using AP, you know, you need to reverse out of the bank that you made the payment, which would be the EFT clearing account. And then you also need to do that reversal of that bank transfer for not for the entire payment uh, batch, but just for that payment amount out of your real bank account. So it is a double up when you come to uh, reversals, which is a trade off. Yeah. OK, thank you for that clarification. But hopefully you have fewer reversals than actual payments. But it's worth noting. and. Um, we may or may not have a knowledge base article on that, but if we don't, we'll add a, a tip to our documentation. The next uh, topic we're looking at is EFT uh, emailing. And email configuration is one of the hot topics on our support desk. So hopefully we'll share a few tips that make it easier for you um, ongoing. And a common question that we have is how to configure a port in um, in your service, and that's particularly relevant for things like Office 365 or um, or Gmail. In uh, Sage Company Profile, there's a special field to put the port number. In uh, EFT emails, and that applies to all of um, the other ORCID modules as well, there is no special field. So if you need to put the port because um, that is required by your um, SMTP server or your uh, firewall, your your internal setup then you need to use um, colon and put the port number after your server name. And in many cases, when you're uh, using uh, TLS, it will be um, 587, but could be whatever is configured by your IT team. When sending, and, and this is a, a tricky one because sometimes you get an error message, but sometimes it looks like it's gone out, but it doesn't actually um, get to the uh, email recipient. 
When you send an email using uh, the SMTP configured in EFT options, it uses a program called sendmail.exe, which is sitting in your uh, EL68A folder for 2021, so inside your, your Sage uh, directory. Sometimes when you're using it a lot or whatever, some antivirus might quarantine that file. So it's important to make sure that that, fi that file is, um, is allowed if you're having issues with email. Again, something that has um, come up more recently with um, things like Google or Office 365, you can configure limits per minute or limits per session of the number of emails that are being sent by, um, by, by EFT. So um, that is relevant if you, to, if you are getting um, messages that you're blocked by your email provider because you're sending too many emails too quickly and they might think you are spamming. Something that we have started seeing uh, recently is using app passwords in Office 365 or in uh, Gmail as an alternative to two-factor authentication. Uh, we are um, doing some more uh, testing on this and documenting the exact steps, uh, but we have worked with a few people who have um, uh, configured that and it works. So if this is relevant for you, please get in touch with us in support at orchid.systems and we can help you configure that. Another question we get regularly is which email address is used when sending emails, uh, the remittance advice. So you can configure that in uh, EFT um, against your vendors or customers or employees, whether you use an email address specified in EFT or whether you use the method on uh, the AP or AR or employee uh, record. Multiple contacts, which is now available in Sage 300, is currently not supported by EFT, will be in a future product update. But in the meantime, if you need to send a remittance advice to multiple email addresses, you can use your different email addresses in EFT options separated by a semicolon and the field is 250 characters long, so that should give you quite a few email addresses. Finally, we'll look at some tips to configure message templates. Since uh, sometime last year, we've been able to use HTML in your email templates. While we don't provide an HTML editor, you can copy and paste from the F1 Help or from an online uh, HTML editor, which lets you format, control a bit more the format of the email that is sent. And in particular, when you're using the variable called DocList to send a list of invoices, it helps the alignment of, um, of that list of um, documents applied to the payment. And we've also added a new option called Doc AMT List, which lets you list all these documents, but doesn't include the actual uh, document description, just the number, date, and amount. So let's now look at that in uh, Sage. There you go, Anne. Thanks, Natalie. So with the email setup, if you fill in um, AP, AR, or payroll emails, or on these payroll and AP, you can say, uh, sorry, payroll and AR, you can say use AP. But if you fill in SMTP details in our EFT options, then it means all, EF, all emails are sent using these details, not what you fill in in Sage. If you leave this blank, then we will use what you've configured in common services. But if you want to remember, if you want to do remittance advice passwords, then you need to fill it in um, here. Um, so Natalie was mentioning the port. If you do need to include a port, it's colon and then the port number. And whenever you're setting up details here, just ask IT how your SMTP server is configured, because some or more of these fields are mandatory based on your SMTP setup, like some require an email comes from, some don't require an email comes from. Um, and what you should do is fill it in as what they say and then send a test email and make sure that you get the test email because sometimes you won't get an error message here because the SMTP email server doesn't actually reject it with an error message like 
you must provide an email comes from. It just doesn't send it on though because it doesn't meet some of its rules. So you need to uh, just make sure you get that email as well. And uh, don't just test on internal emails, test on an external email as well. And um, we do try and leave, uh, put some hints here of the common errors. Um, the most common one we have is, um, as Natalie mentioned, in our programs directory, you've got a sendemail.exe, which is the program that's actually sending the email. And if virus checkers are not disabled on that um, folder, um, and sometimes firewalls don't allow that program or disable that program because it might you know, suddenly send 50 emails a minute or something like that, and uh, you know, it could be considered a spam. So you need to make sure your virus, uh, uh, your antivirus is not uh, looking at that program and quarantining it, and that the firewall is, is not blocking that in some way as well. Some email servers uh, don't allow you to send more than X number of emails per minute or per session. So you can set it here. Um, in which case we would send the 30 and then wait till the minute's up and then send the next 30 and wait till the minute's up or disconnect the session and reconnect the session and send another 30, depending on how you have that. Um, and I've mentioned already that you, you need to fill this in if you want to apply a password to your remittance advices. As to which email address do we use on the EFT customer, vendor, and, and on the EFT employee, you can select whether you're going to use their email address specified on, in my case, the EFT vendor, so it's going to use this, or AP delivery method, in which case it goes to AP and sees if you're set to print, it will physically print or print preview, depending on what uh, your remittance advice, your printer settings are at the time of running your remittance advice, or it'll use the vendor's email address or the vendor's contact email address, depending what you've set up in AP. Same for AR and payroll, I don't think has, um, it just has the email address. So you either use e email address from e um, the EFT employee or from the Sage's employee record. And if you are using EFTs, this field is uh, 250 characters long. So if you need multiple email addresses, semicolon, and you put all the email addresses that you need, semicolon, so separating them. And over the next few months, we will include support for Sage's multiple contacts, but it's not uh, included yet. And the, uh, your email messages at the moment, our sample data is just set up to use normal text, so you can include the, the you know the variables that are listed in the help. So if we go to the F1 help, it shows you all the variables, whether it's APAR or payroll. You can see the variables that that you can include in in your email body. And uh, we've got the as Natalie was mentioning the doc list, which is the document the applied document number amount, description, and date. Um, but if you don't want to include the description, if you're using that for internal purposes, then you can use doc amount list, which is just the document number and the date and the amount. And if you're just using text, it's not so easy to um, format that. But um, sometime last year, we included the ability to um, use HTML in our email addresses. And we have some examples here, although they're not set in our sample data. So if we look, for example, um, at the HTML example, you can just copy and paste from here into your email template. And that's a good start to get going. And here, you know, this is, it includes, it's not an e HTML email editor. So you do need to use an email editor to know what these tags are. Um, and you know, then you include the variables as you need them. So if we wanted to use the new one, doc amount list, you would do it like that, and that would be your remittance advice uh, for in HTML, which looks a bit nicer than just straightforward text. Back to you, Natalie. Thank you. So we now have um, six minutes for. Um, questions and um, a few um, high-level uh, presentations of a few other uh, topics. 
So as we mentioned at the beginning, it's not a detailed training session on um, creating AR receipts or AR refunds. So in the next um, topic, we will um, touch on what you can um, do there, especially the new features that were introduced earlier this year, and there is a detailed presentation on that. So when you're using AR, you can use EFT to update your um, invoice due date in case something has happened to, to your terms or and um, you, that all gets logged in the EFT audit trail as to um, when and by whom the invoice due date was updated. And you can then use the invoice due date to create your AR receipts, your AR refunds, and um, also the ability to create an AR receipt of a zero value, which lets you match your debits and your, um, your credits. So we'll um, touch on that. And uh, to um, finish off, well, I'll hand over back to Anne to do this demo very shortly, but we'll introduce some, some tips we want to share around EFT payroll. We'll probably do those two at the same time. And um, again, this is just, uh, you know, high level, some commonly asked question, how to get started with emailing your T4 and Releve 1, how to print your pay slip, and um, whether you save or not the PDF of your uh, payslip, what um, controls that configuration. So I'll hand back over to you, Anne. Thanks, Natalie. So the first uh, thing we're going to show you uh, some features in AR. So at a very high level, there are training videos on the website for this. So either for because you want to use the due date on documents to select for your receipt batches, or just because you want to tidy up your um, age trial balance, by customer and document or by customer and multiple documents, you can change the invoice due date and the um, discount dates as well. So here if I could go ahead and change the uh, due date and any discount dates if that was the, if that was the case and if the invoice was created through OE or just AR both OE and AR invoice details are updated so it's not nothing to do with dollar values it's just dates um, so it doesn't affect um, just due dates it doesn't affect uh, any any posted transaction other than uh, saving that and in the order trail periodic processing, you can see who changed what when. So the first purpose of that is if you if you are using your um, receipt selection codes, your create receipt batch to create your direct debit batches for customers, then you can in the criteria use the invoice due date. So all invoices due um, by Friday, go ahead and create a direct debit batch. It's just an AR receipt batch. And then you can go ahead and post that and then send that through to the bank. But you can, even if you're not sending it through to the bank for direct debits, if you if you know that you always get these invoices paid regularly because uh, they're, you know, your rental or, or whatever it is, um, then you can use this as well to help you create receipt batches. And then earlier this year, what we did is uh, enhance this so that you can create not only receipt batches, but also refund batches. So you can then, um, you know, use, if you have the case where you do have a multiple, uh, I've only got one template set up, you do have multiple credits against the customer and at the end of the month you do settle them off, then you could use create refund batch and then say which bank you want to do it, say how you want to deal with the national accounts and customers and whether or not you want to auto post that batch after running. And at the same time, we included the feature to be able to create a zero value receipt batch. So in this case, the, you know, the receipt amount will be zero, but it will just apply documents in the date ranges or a selection criteria that you found. So if you do have the case where you have lots of invoices and lots of credits which are not applied or lots of receipts which are not applied, you can use this to create zero value receipt batches and apply documents um, and it just uses, you know, the oldest first in the, uh, as Sage does when you do that auto apply as well. So you can use that to help clean up your, your AR. 
regarding payroll and uh, sending the uh, T4 and Releve ones, so as, as you know, in uh, payroll, you can send your T4s and Releve ones at any time and they can be regenerated. So EFT does not store those. It can password protect them, but it does not store them. So if you come to your transaction reports and you print Releve ones or print T4s, you can select to do the employee method, which will be email or print, depending what you've set up on the EFT employee. And then you select the report that would default from your EFT options. And you would go ahead, make whatever selections you need and print, which would email using this message ID and this report or print, depending on what your setting is. So that's for the Releve 1 and T4. And as you know, you can do that as many times as you want. So we don't save a copy of that. However, for your print payroll and pay stips, we do save a copy. If you have specified a directory in your EFT options, which I showed you earlier. So in EFT setup options on your default advices, if you set up a directory for your pay slips, then when you come to print your uh, or email your pay slips, um, I've got too much open. When you come to print your uh, email your pay slips, it's going to password protect, save a copy in that directory and print it off. Because as you know, um, Sage does not allow you to send pay slips, uh, you know, other than you have to have your um, you have to calculate your pay and you need to, um, with payroll transactions, you need to run your payroll checks, um, calculate your pay. I'm not sure if I've got one ready to go. So, no, I don't have anything ready to go, but you would normally uh, print and post. And at the point in time when you've got those checks calculated, that's the time when you can print your pay slips in Sage. And that's the only time that we can email the pay slips. So you need to leave this run open and then at the same time, go into your uh, print payroll stubs and print the uh, email those pay slips. And then go back to your uh, checks, uh, payroll checks and then post that. Um, sorry, I think I should have been in the calculate payroll option. So we can only send the pay slips and we're using the Sage's pay slip that you may or may not have customized. It's not anything that EFT is providing other than just the ability to email that particular report. So after the fact, after you've posted those payroll, those pay slip, uh, the pay, um, the, pay, the checks, the payroll checks, you won't be able to send the pay slip anymore, just as you can't in Sage. Some people do use a customized report, which you can replace our remittance advice with to send the last details, but you can't get all the year to date totals that you can in the pay slip. Um, but so, yeah, the pay slip needs to be sent at the time you calculate the payroll when you've printed the checks but not yet posted them. You can email out the pay slip. Um, what is uh, a question? What is the difference between the pay slip and the payroll advice? So, the payroll advice, and it can be sent at any time. The payroll advice is really like the AP side, it's just the amount that we're paying. So if you go to the AFT transaction reports and you do your payroll advices, it's a, a an EFT customized report. Um, it's based on the payroll period end date and all it can include is the amount paid. So there's no breakdown of that pay. There's no uh, year-to-date totals, there's no deductions. It's saying, you know, we transferred hundred dollars to this bank account on this date that's what the payroll advice is and it's an EFT report and it's based on the payroll amount only whereas the pay slip is a sage report and it's the full pay advice it's you know all the deductions year-to-date totals and whatever other good things you put on a pay slip Um, any advice on how to handle payroll where some employees are EFT 
and some are checks in terms of printing and emailing the payroll advices. Um, well, our, our payslip, uh, sorry, I had to think a bit about that. Um, our uh, print payroll stubs is nothing to do with EFT. So whether you're sending those, those amounts via EFT or not, uh, when you print your payslips, it's the same as when you're in Calculate Payroll print payslips. So my, my assumption is your payslip would be um, the same. It, it would just come off your Calculate Payroll. Um, you've gone to Calculate Payroll, you've done your print check, you leave that screen open, you come here and it will email. So it will email all your payslips for you. You would still use payroll to then print some of those checks. Um, and if you're using, oh, so maybe that's the question. If you're using our EFT to, to send some of those, then you need them in two different payroll runs for the same date. Because when we come to create the um, EFT file based on payroll, you're specifying a payroll date. So in EFT transactions, create payroll file, you're having a payroll period end date, or you could select also by check number. Depends how you want to do that. But you might have two runs for your payroll period end date and then or a check number range as which to get included in your EFT file as opposed to printing the payroll advice. Um, Prab is saying use selection list. Um, selection list, so EFT, the create EFT file does not use selection list. So as that you could do that for your payslip, but not for the uh, selection file. But I see you're saying use selection list to run the first create payroll, um, send that via email, and then use selection list for the same date to do a second run and do pay slips and don't send that one via EFT. Yes, thanks, Prabha. You should be doing the presentation, not me. <clears throat> okay. What about the check number printing? So that's control, you're talking about payroll, um, Jack, uh, Dean? The check number printing is controlled by your AP side. Um, if you're doing AP payments, and you're using EFT, a, a payroll to ch control the pe check number for payroll. So it's not really an EFT question, unless you're saying, can you have your own AP check numbers? You can, you just configure a check stock code in AP, which has EFT check numbers or payment numbers to keep track of, but <clears throat> doesn't really have a print a check to print. Um, another question, when it saves the pay stubs, can it be saved under a folder for each employee? Yes, that's exactly how it happens. So in you specify in EFT options, you set, specify just the, the base um, folder. So here it says C ORCID payslips. So in my C ORCID payslips directory, it um, creates uh, C Orchid pay slips. It creates automatically, it creates a folder per company and then a folder for employee. And then the PDF is password protected. So if you um, double click to open it up, you need to provide the password, which I'm not sure which this one is. So I won't be able to open that one up. But yes, it's automatically per company per employee. And you can use document management link to that folder to link your pay slips to, um, to the employee record if you want. Um, is there a drop down when printing from Sage versus for EFT versus printed? Sorry, I don't quite understand that question, Jaime. Oh, there is a drop down. Uh, thank you, Jaime. So there is a drop down saying when printing or for Sage. Okay. So if you're using Sage's EFT for um, payroll, 
uh, payments, then you get a drop down. Is that what you're saying? I think that's what you're saying. So yep, we wouldn't have that. You'd just need to control it by a selection list as, as Prava was saying, and do it in two separate runs. Um, so yes, Jaime's saying, so the option really is you just got to do two separate payroll runs, one for the um, checks and then the second one for the EFT payments, uh, correct. And you'd use a selection list to do those two different runs and you would print your email, your pay advices at the same time. And I think that then answers your question as well, uh, Dean, you would have two payroll runs EFT only and then uh, checks. Okay. I think that's all the questions. Oh, I've seen we've run over to, by 10 minutes, apologies. Well, that's possibly a good sign. If you um, just, um, there was, some questions earlier that I think we answered uh, privately, but might be uh, worth reiterating for uh, everyone's benefit since we've spent a fair bit of time with peril related questions. When you use, and that was back to what we started with at the beginning, when you use, uh, you want to use two step approval and your um, separation of duty, does the active um, back to enter change happen automatically? when you change an EFT vendor or employee or customer record? Uh, yes, it does. If you set your default vendor status to ended, and if the user that um, does the change does not have rights to approve, then uh, yes, it will flip it automatically if you're logged in as a user who only has um, enter right. So a user who can enter and edit, or well, the group is actually called edit, right? So if they are allowed to edit, the minute they change, it automatically flips back to entered. So that is a great um, security setting. So there's no particular switch for that. And um, last question on um, security for George is, uh, we may not have made that 100% clear, but in terms of the folder where your file is saved when you're using network folder, when you create the file, the user who creates the file needs right access to that um, to that folder using network security. And then a separate user can upload it to the bank and they would normally only need read access to, um, to that folder. So, the path is configured there and you use network security to protect who can read and write that. So hopefully that answers um, a lot of your um, questions and um, you know we've covered a range of things so hopefully everyone found something um, interesting in there and um, if you There's have one more question, Natalie, about global file sequence numbers. Um, so can I uh, speak to global file sequence number tab and when should it be used? Um, so some banks require a sequence number that goes up by one um, each time you submit a file. And if you do want to use a feature, that feature, or if your bank is requiring you to uh, provide that feature, then what you need to do is, um, is sorry, it, it, your file in your file naming is name your file by the file sequence number, and here you put in the number that you're going to start with. Um, so seven eight seven is going to be plus one. Seven eight eight will be the first file sequence number that goes out with this particular, with the next export I do. If I need to recreate the file for any reason, then you would need to set this one back um, so that you get the same file sequence number because it's normally the name of the file and it's normally contained in the file as well. And normally you have a file sequence number per bank. So if I was doing uh, payments and receipts, I might use the same file sequence number um, that I'm using from payments because they, they might say to you, 
use the same file sequence number or they might say to you it's got its own file sequence number and same for payroll so whether you've got use the same file sequence number for this bank for every file or maybe you're going to have a separate file sequence number for each of the three file types that you may or may not be sending through um, so that's the normal processing and how that happens but in some cases uh, and I, I don't know if some banks um, you might have multiple bank accounts with them so physical bank accounts but they ask for a running sequence across all the bank accounts in which case you would use global file sequence number one two or three we've got ten of them and you would say for CCB and my FCB I'm using global file sequence number one and then on the EFT options you would say what your next number is and it would use that one accordingly so it's a way of having a file sequence number that runs across multiple banks will the recording be made available uh, yes in the next couple of days we will send out the recording link to all of the attendees and it will be on our website as well I'm not seeing any other questions. So thanks very much for attending. Um, and we look forward to speaking to you at our next webinar in November. Bye. Bye. Enjoy the rest of your day.